friends. I am Tom Earl. On this week's episode, some of my really amazing and awesome friends join me for a Q&A session. Check it out. <laughs> Greetings. I am Tom Earl, and this is my year of grace. We know you could be anywhere, so the fact that you're here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are appreciated, and you are loved. As you can see, I am not alone. I have some amazing guests. Y'all out there, could you snap it up? Let people know you're there. (laughs) Woo! So today what we have is a live Q&A episode with... Each person that's here is someone that I care deeply about and means a lot to me, part of my world, part of my community. So you get a twofer. I wanted to introduce you to them and at the same time for them to ask some questions they have on their mind, either about me, about things I do, anything they think I might be able to add value to and for us to just have a little bit of a conversation. So let's start by having you uh, get to know them. So my friends that are here, here's how we're going to introduce ourselves to each other and to the good folks listening, is if you could share your name, your pronouns, and the prompt is, if you could eat knowledge, what would be your first meal? If you could eat knowledge, what would be your first meal? Who would like to jump in and start us off by introducing yourself like that? I guess I'll go. Perfect. Go ahead, Sadia. <laughs> Although that is really hard. So my name is Sadia. Um, my pronouns are she, her, that if I could eat knowledge, my first thought would be I would eat history, although it's probably extremely depressing, <laughs> but maybe um, like any kind of history, especially uh like seeing where the religions originated. (laughs) Mm, That'd be dope. I sit down to a meal with you on that one. (laughs) Can we snap it up for Sadia, please? Okay, Grant, I know I'm giving away the punchline, but why don't we have you introduce yourself next? Sure. My name is Grant, and I'm very tall. You can't see that from me sitting here, but I am. And... (laughs) That's something about me. My pronouns are he, him, his. And if I was going to eat knowledge, I would probably also in line with that history theme. I I specifically am curious about the history of uh, Korea in the 20th century right now. And I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that. Dang. Snap it up for Grant and that specificity. (laughs) I love that. Okay, let's have Samia. Why don't you go next? Cool, this. All right, so my name is Samia, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And if I could eat knowledge, actually the thing I want to learn most about these days is how to create more, uh, like time. How to, the idea of creating time. I've been reading about that and I want to learn more. I, I got to ask a follow-up on that one. What do you mean by creating time? Like that for you, there'd be 28 hours in the day? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm reading this really interesting book called You Squared. And there's just a very short chapter in there about this idea of creating time. He's like, look, time's a created thing anyway. Time is relative concept. And you can learn how to just create all the time you want. So you never have to feel rushed about anything. And you have all the time you want to do whatever you want. I'm like, hey, tell me more. But he has only just a tiny little little like uh, chapter on it in the book. So I'm like, uh, how can I learn more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm down for that meal. That's awesome. Can we step it up for Samia, please? And then there was the amazing. I'm Remy, uh, AKA Yummy Online. I use they, them. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I um, I drink a bunch of water, just like regular water. And 
than eat like just like musical texts right now i think mm. the, the meal of mu- music music yeah alone? yeah like a like whatever sheet music mm. that's awesome Woo! all right let's snap it up for remy i am tom earl i use he and him pronouns I would eat the ability to speak every single language in existence now, ever, or to come. That'd be my meal. Nice. Let's have it up for Tom. (laughs) (laughs) So as you can see, we're going to have a laid back, fun time, uh, answer questions. And if there's questions that people ask, if y'all want to jump in, raise your hand, you want to add your two cents. Maybe if the the light's getting a little bright, I might be like, what do y'all think? We'll see. We'll try to stick to time, though. The more we do that, the longer we'll go over. So we'll just take a relaxed pace about this. And we'll just have each person go ahead and ask their questions. So I believe, Sadia, you are up first. And so, Sadia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And then we will have you ask your question. Okay. Hi, I'm Sadia. Um, I am currently in San Antonio, although I live in California, um, but I'm going back to the East Coast. I'm super excited about that. And I wanted to tell you that my, um, my guilty pleasures right now are some Netflix shows. Well, I'm a YouTube addict and I love The Good Place, but also, super confession, I love um, my little pony. <laughs> it's actually so clever. And I started watching it and I'm really liking it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that intro and I'm a big fan of the good place as well. Uh, I'd also like to add Sadia is an amazing musician. She's an awesome activist and she's really awesome in this nonprofit ish space that she's in. I know it's not exactly nonprofit, but that, that space. So wonderful. So Let's jump into it. What is your question? Okay. So I have a a deep dive for you right away. Um, So I've known you for a while. You are very knowledgeable about social justice issues. I'll just use that umbrella term. And you once told me that every person Uh should have the confidence of a mediocre white man. (laughs) So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what role privilege plays in entrepreneurship in America specifically. Mm, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I didn't coin that phrase. I didn't come up with that phrase. The have the confidence of a mediocre white man. Well, so let's talk about the industry that I'm particularly a part of: thought leadership, you know, online courses, group coaching, business development that it's largely when you look at the people who are on the biggest stages with the biggest clients, it's mostly like other industries, unfortunately, white men. So one of the ways privilege plays into that is that people for reasons of white supremacy, and I'm like looking at you and what, like explain this to you. You already know this, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm answering for the people out there. So I'm not like, Sadia, there's this thing called privilege. So just giving that disclaimer. That, you know, when you go to speak about business development or, and by you, I mean me, a white man, go to speak about business development or social media or coaching, that when I enter the room, my whiteness because of white supremacy is going to have people believe me without a lot of barriers versus if I was a woman, you know, if I was a a white woman, a woman of color, or if I was some other thing that you could see besides like an able-bodied and you were assuming I was straight, all these kind of things, that there's not barriers to you having entry to my knowledge. So there's just that, you know, systemic thing there. But what also happens is I'll make an arrangement with you to speak at your course or speak at your event. And then in return, you come speak at my event. And so what happens is kind of this like network of a white guy will speak at another white guy's event. So then that white guy will speak at that white guy's event. And then that white guy will speak at a different white guy's event. So then they speak at there and it becomes this like very insular that the only people who seem to be, when you go to these events, they'll have three guest speakers and they'll all be white guys. 
and it just self perpetuates itself. And I've said it before when me and I have been talking on the phone, what's crazy to me is a lot of people will have like coaching certification programs or they'll have live speaking pro, you know, training programs. And most of the people I notice are in the audience are women being certified by these white guys. And what always gets me fired up is it just kind of communicates that, Hey, I'm going to train you on how to one day be on my stage. That's like what they sell. But that, because I only, from what I've shown, 95% of the time have white guys on my stage, you just won't speak on my stage. So pay me my 10, 15 grand to certify you, but you won't ever speak on a stage like mine. Now, do most people do that intentionally? I think that most, a lot of the people in this industry are really good people trying to do good things. And then it's implicit bias that it's, because what you hear a lot of people say, and I'm, I'm sure Samia can speak to hearing this too, is you'll hear people say, Oh my God, we got such a diverse room. We got, we're translating 10 languages. We got people from a whole bunch of continents. And I'm looking around, I'm like, like, I guess there's only white people at all the continents that you're talking about. Like only people with white skin that are all these different languages. And yeah, there's like a splat, a spattering of people, but there's just like an intentionality of diversity of, you know, considering multiple things. I don't think most people are doing because I don't think most people think that there's even a problem with it. Did I answer your question? Thoroughly, yes. Thank you. You know, one other thing I'd say is, is what you find happens is where there's spaces that are diverse and by diverse, you know, meaning not white guys, is usually you have to say like explicitly, I'm a coach for women. And then you'll find a space that's like more diverse. So it's, it's kind of, you know, somebody was saying, I saw in a group, they were like, hey, if I'm creating a course that's geared towards men, what are the men's specific hashtags I can use, you know, that you'll see like hashtag women empowerment, hashtag women entrepreneur. Like why aren't there any like hashtag men entrepreneur? And that right there just totally uncovers what privilege is because when I'm a man and I say entrepreneur, I don't have to put my gender in front of it because mm. just like when we say mm-hmm. women you, without having to say something, the idea is you're saying white women. So same thing, entrepreneur that, you know, it automatically means more or less man entrepreneur. So all hashtags are already men centered. So I don't have to put the, you know, what's that called? Distinguisher in front of it. So I think that's a real good, you know, explanation of, you know, a good example too of what privilege looks like even within the hashtags. Dope. Anything else? Sadia? Oh, for me. I'm sorry. That was like an open question. And I was waiting for people to jump in. <laughs> that was a good first question. Thanks for jumping us off so intentionally. Thank you. Wonderful. Grant, I believe you're next. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then ask your question. Cool. Hey, everyone. My name is Grant. I'm here in Los Angeles. And it's so hot right now. It's crazy. I'm super excited for it to cool down a little bit shortly but uh we're having a beautiful sort of last gasp of summer um i'm an avid reader i read a lot audiobooks uh books magazines and uh i'm really excited about the world of reading mm, wonderful thanks grant it is very hot i have to turn off all the fans and air conditioning and i got this bright light that's why i'm getting shinier and shinier as this episode <laughs> continues so Oh, wonderful. So Grant, what's your question for us? Sure. Well, I, well I'll start with one and then time permitting, I'll ask a follow a second question kind of unrelated, but uh, I was just talking with uh, my colleagues today a bit about goal setting and we were kind of walking through, you know, uh, a version of what that looks like. And I sort of, I maybe assume about you that you're someone who maybe sets or checks in on goals that you've uh, you know, created for yourself. And I just wanted to kind of get, uh, you know, maybe your thoughts on, you know, also and kind of to put a little asterisk to this, I did listen to the podcast you were, you were featured on where you would, and I also know that had like relinquished a particular goal of like you had, you had a, uh, a business development group. That's where, how I know you in, in part. Uh, and, you know, so also not only setting goals, checking in on them and working towards them, but also, you know, then releasing certain goals that you're working towards that 
maybe are no longer serving you or your project in the, in the same way. So yeah, I guess to sum it up, your thoughts on goal setting in general. Yeah, I love that question. Thanks, Grant. And thanks for, you checked out Jasmine Stars that episode? I did, yeah. What did you think? I thought it was great. I, mean, I wish you got more airtime. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Send that into her. Like, I loved your episode, but more time. <laughs> we need more cowbell. <laughs> exactly. So goal setting. I l- Let me get clear, too. Do you want, are you, when you talk about goal setting, does it have anything to do with like time management and implementation of the goal? Or just like, what do I do for like envisioning like big goals? Like, I want to make sure I'm answering if you have a specific. Well, both. I mean, it's, it's big to small, right? Like to get to a, to accomplish a big goal, you got to take small steps along the way. So uh, I think it's kind of the gamut. So I think that one of the most important things when you're doing goal setting or, you know, time management or any of those things is to make sure that you're not expecting of yourself to accomplish, to implement, to do more than you really have the capacity to do. Because once you get into that place of overwhelm where I have all these goals and I'm really not seeing much effort in any of them because I'm feeling that constant state of overwhelm, that's when you start to feel demoralized and you start to hate the game. And for the most part, that's usually when you also are no longer in the process. You start to become like a taskmaster, trying to do this and do that so that ultimately one day I will reach this place and therefore be happy. So I guess that's then the second point is when we think of goals, for the most part, a lot of the goals we create because we believe in the accomplishing of them, we will achieve a feeling that we are after. Happiness, security, freedom, all of those kind of things. So what the finding the process is figuring out what that feeling is that I'm already looking for and seeing the ways I already have that in my life. So if one is, one of my goals is to, you know, make $100,000 a year. So then I would want to become self-reflective on what is it that I believe I will feel or what do I believe that will create in my life from having $100,000. So for a lot of us, especially around finances, it'd be things like choice, freedom, no restriction, those kind of things. So if there's always this place where I feel like I'm missing something and not missing something from a place of excitement, but missing something like I feel lack and not theoretically, like I I genuinely feel until I have this, I'm going to feel absent. Then I would look around in my life and say, where do I already have freedom? So for instance, like my arm, like I can move my arm around in a full circle. My dad's had three rotator cuff shirt surgeries. And so I know that there's a miracle. There's a blessing and being able to have the freedom of movement of your arms, you know, different things like that. So I'd find that feeling of the goal I have now. And now it's no longer about trying to fulfill a hole in me. I already have that. And now I'm enjoying the process of achieving this next goal because then the third part is I believe that our goals come from someplace spiritual, that we're in partnership with whatever you want to call a higher being in making the world a better place. And we do that a lot of times through inspired goals. So when those inspired goals come to us, all the different tasks, texts have some sort of version of, if you were given the vision, then you will be given the provision. But I believe that you can't really align with that provision or those next steps if you're in that place of lack. So once you connect with that feeling or that emotion, you fulfill it already before I even get there. Now you're in that relaxed state, that place you come out of meditation or when you first wake up in the morning or you're singing in the shower. Or for me, I just get off the bike and spin class and you're feeling excited. You get this random idea. You know what? I should text this person. For example, one was this week earlier. I got home and I was feeling really great. And I thought I should call my mom. So I called my mom and she's been trying to book flight tickets to come out and see me. Usually to go from Wisconsin to where do I live? LA costs like three fifty. dollars So I got this inclination to call her, called her. She's like, oh, I can only find a tickets for 400 and they require one stop in Vegas. So I'm like, screw that. So I got on, I looked up, I found a nonstop flight for her for $105. I've never seen a flight ever that cheap. Turns out within like 
five hours ago, that airline that I bought the ticket from had to emergency land one of their planes because they spilled something on the plane and had to emergency land it. So all of their tickets took a, like a dump and you could buy tickets anywhere from the airline just within those couple hours for cheap. So that to me is an example. Where did I get that inclination from to be able to make this goal happen of my mom coming out here in a way that was better than it ever could have happened? To me, it was in that place where it wasn't coming from a sense of lack. So all that to say, once you do those kind of places, then for me, a lot of my goals become more intuitive than structured as in I used to do and I still encourage to get the muscle memory to get that habit where I would you know, vision board, or I would create, you know, like I'd write down all the things that I want to do. And then this is, for example, if people, if you don't know what are the things you want to do is to write down everything you, that you are feeling inspired by, and then chunk it into as big of things as possible rather than little things. And for me doing that a bunch of times, then I was able to get the muscle memory that intuitively when I'm going on my every morning walk, or I'm doing my every night meditation, or I'm doing all of these things, I'm able to kind of start to intuit what my next goals are without having to do it in a very structured way. That was dope, Grant. Great question. That brought out some nice <sighs> things I haven't fully articulated in a way like that sequentially. So I was, I was feeling it as I was saying it not to be, well, y'all already know that I love myself. So <laughs> no need to. As you that. should. <laughs> Any follow-up questions on that? When you said chunk it up, I'm kind of hearing you say, like you were talking about like kind of building a feeling around like what achieving a goal would accomplish for you. Are you saying like, look at different goals that you have in different areas of your life and see like what's sharing like a common origin source or like, what do you mean by chunking up? Okay. So this, this one's more like, what's that word called? Administrative, tactical, less feeling, more like nitty gritty. So if you have, if you're thinking of your to-do list or you're thinking of what are the things that I want to do next or what are my goals, when we have a lot of those things in our mind, that's when we get back to my first point that when you're in a state of overwhelm, usually because you're doing too much, you're never going to get into that place of fulfillment. So you would write down every to-do that you can possibly think of in as micro or macro as you want, you know, like mm -hmm. um, I got a... I can't think of a to do's. <laughs> I call it a brain dump. I call it a brain dump. I'm thinking of everything I have to do big and small. So you, you write, write that all down. down. Thank you for saving yeah. me. So you write that all down. Then you would say, if I was to put all of these brain dumps into five categories, what would those categories be? Mm -hmm. Usually at that point you might say, well, one is I have my professional life and my personal life. Boom. Mm -hmm. Now I have like two tops. There's two levels of this pyramid next within each of those personal and professional what are the things in there? So let's say within personal, you have like family and relationships, health and fitness, spirituality and rest. One might be like hobbies, you know, so you have these kind of things that you can now chunk these. And then maybe within your business, you have like marketing, finance, envisioning, personal development. So now instead of, oh my God, I got a million things to do. First of all, you only have two things to do, personal life or professional life. So just even right there, what do you really have when you take into consideration first your personal life? How much time do you have left over? Or if you're going to do the other way, when I really take into consideration my professional life, I really only have how many hours left over. So that already gets you to, instead of being all over the place, get very clear on in these two key important areas of your life, how much time you have for each. So if you say, I'm going to be very disciplined. I have 40 hours in this part of my life, 20 hours in the other part of my life, however many hours in the week. Then you would go and say, so if I have... 20 hours for personal life, where do I want to invest within these buckets? So if you're like, well, each week, I definitely want to do two hours a week in meditation and spirituality, or I want to invest an hour each day. So that's seven hours in family and relationships. So then as you're going through, like, if you were to say, okay, well, within family and relationships, what would be your chunks? Well, one might be like one-on-one -on -one time. One might be like messaging, one might be surprising people. So now you have like, it's no longer this huge, like, oh my God, I got so much to do. It's like, no, I got two things. And now when you're in one side of those two things, okay, I only had five things. And I've allocated today that I'm going to focus on this one thing. And there's really only two things. So it just makes it more not crazy and gets you actually very clear on 
what you actually can do and what you can't do. And once you get clear on that, then you're going to have to say, and this is what I, for example, I no longer am doing inner power group coaching because I realize I only have so many hours in the week. And right now I need to bless and release this one so that I can focus on this new goal. Because if I keep doing both, neither is going to get accomplished. So when Mm -hmm. you do the chunking, you have to get like really honest and disciplined and sometimes even a little bit ruthless in cutting things off that you are going to admit you don't have the time for. Obviously, then once you ruthlessly decide I'm going to cut this off, you then bring empathy and grace and dignity to communicating I'm cutting this off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Great question. Cool. Thanks. So how about we we jump to everybody else and then if... if, uh, you want to ask your second question, we can stay on it and I can answer it. Does that sound good? Perfect. Yep. Cool. All right. We next have Samia. Okay, Samia, why don't you first tell us a little bit about yourself and then what your question is? All righty. Um, okay, so once again, my name is Samia Bano. And professionally, I'm a happiness expert and the author of Make Change Fun and Easy. And uh, actually, there's one more thing that I do on the side, and my question's more related to that, so I'm going to mention it. So I'm also working part-time at the Women's Mosque of America. And the question I had was, well, with regards to utilizing online platforms and so forth to sort of, you know, spread the word about our movement. and um so like we have a facebook group we have instagram we have youtube we like set up all these different channels but you know we are a very small team i mean i'm the only person who's on staff and even i'm just part-time and so while there are like so many amazing ideas about you can do this you can do this you can do this to you know create publicity uh we honestly just don't have the capacity so basically the question is that because we have limited resources both in terms of time and money um, how do we figure out like where to focus our efforts um, in terms of like what kind of strategies to focus on using what platform to focus on using Uh, because like I said when when we first got started you know we we set up channels on and accounts with like all the platforms that we could figure out and you know there's just too much great question it's an awesome organization so i appreciate getting the chance to to jump in on it uh do you know kind of you know the process i was talking about before do you know how much time you have how much time do you have a week or a month to dedicate to this (sighs) Uh, for just the marketing purposes, I would say like if I could keep it to like a couple of hours a week, uh, that would be fabulous. But I don't know if that's realistically enough time. So realistically, you would want like 10 to 20 people full time working on this. So none of us have that. You know what I mean? But to do everything there is, you're going to need like 10 to 20 people full time professional, amazing pay, best of the best. So we don't have that. So realistically, you're never going to have enough time. So let's start with the time you do have. Like, would you say you have two hours a week? You have four hours a week? Yeah, I can, I can easily manage like a couple of hours a week. Yeah. But what's a couple? Two. Okay. Like literally Perfect. a couple. Because three, I was thinking three. So that's an uh, extra hour a week. That's four uh, more hours a month. So that's uh, what I mean. Okay. So, are y'all recording your chutbas? So you have those already, right? Yes. Where do you already have people following you? Um, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, uh, in terms of being able to access the recordings, uh, SoundCloud. Um, I think those are the ones where we get the most hits usually so you're already uploading the recordings as a podcast as a podcast uh yes and um videos are available on youtube and facebook okay so right and what about your mailing list how big is your mailing list our 
just email mailing list is just over a thousand people. Uh, but then, yeah, if you look at, for example, Facebook, our supporters group, we have over 6,000 people on our Facebook supporters group. And I don't remember the exact numbers for YouTube in terms of how many people are following the channel. But I remember we have over 50,000 views on, um, like, if you look at collectively all the videos that we have out. Um, yeah. So I would say that I would spend your two hours promoting the podcast. So I, I didn't even know y'all have a podcast and I am a supporter. So are you already announcing in your mailing list that you're, that you have the podcast episode? Not, no, our, our general um, newsletter, we send out two in the month so the first one is basically just announcing hey this is this uh the topic and the sermon and the person who like a brief bio uh of the person and basically just focusing on this is what's happening coming up and okay that's that's the main focus of it yeah and then the second one's just a simple reminder of hey this is happening so is so. Let's say you got four weeks, and yeah. the hood buzz on the and just for people who are listening, hood buzz like the main event where there's the speaker. It's the this we pray Muslims we pray every Friday, so that's when the the speaker would pray. So let's say it's the, let's say it's every the fourth Friday of the month. Let's yeah. just say okay. generally it is. So you send out then would you say the second Friday of the month a reminder that here's our speaker, and then the third Friday of the month do you say. Like, remember, it's next week. Is that how it goes down? Uh, yeah, usually we send out the first blast, second week, third. Uh, well, we try never to go into third week. Goal is always second week. And then the second reminder actually just goes out the Wednesday before the actual, so like two days before the event. Okay, so then I would pick one of those other days. Maybe it's the week after. I'd figure out for you how quickly you can actually get it as a podcast that one of those is an announcement of this week's episode. So whatever your mm-hmm. podcast is called, you know, women's mosque speaks or whatever you call it. You're like, so this week's episode is a replay of hutbah featuring blah, 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 and a little bit of their bio. And they talked about blah, 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 blah. You can listen to it on Spotify. You can listen to it here. You can listen to it there, blah, blah, blah. Then I would spend the rest of your two hours, you know, for that week, chopping up that hour long hutbah or half hour hutbah into one minute clips. Mm. So you basically listen and you're listening like, oh, okay. So someone would go through and listen, maybe while they're going for a walk or whatever. And then what I do is I go for a walk or when I'm on the bus and I'll, I'm, I'll have like an Evernote notes pulled up and I'll write down like, oh, minute three through minute five. That was awesome. And then I'll go through and I'll like listen and I'll chop it into a one minute clip. Then that one minute clip, you know, I'll actually do more like 55 seconds clip so that the last five seconds I can say for the full clip, head to wherever it is on your website. If you don't already have it on your website, you know, head to yeah. womensmosque.org slash hood buzz. You know what I mean? Okay. So yeah. You, so then that you can use like a scheduler, like buffer or something like that. And so you'd, you'd upload that and you say like, so basically you want to create, you know, if it's a half hour, maybe you can create three to five of those. Mm. Then boom, you have three to five. You, you sporadically, you know, are post spacing those out, but it's the same thing you're posting on different ones, just in different ways. So yeah. Instagram, you'd use all 30 hashtags. Facebook, you wouldn't use any hashtags. If you're doing it on LinkedIn, you'd use three hashtags. Then when you're doing your reminder or you're like your announcement email, be like, Hey, so excited that blah, 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 blah is coming out, you know, in two weeks. So excited for them. And as you're signing up, oh, by the way, if you haven't seen this week's, last week's, you know, this week's podcast and then link, rewrite this week's comma, here's a great clip to check out. It's about, and just kind of give a brief explanation. And then I have a little like screenshot of the video that people can click and it opens it up. Mm. That's where I'd spend my time. Cool. Good idea. I like it. So then if you still have time left over after that, I would figure out 
who on your team or if there's anybody on your team who's good with video. Okay. Or what I would do is basically you want to come up with a theme. So I, I have this, if you go to tomrell.com slash toolkit, I lied, tomrell.me slash toolkit. I have a training in there called one minute themed videos. So mm. what that is, is you want to think of a, a prompt that people can think of and respond to in like 10 seconds or less. So my prompt is, what are you grateful for, for today? So you need to think of some sort of prompt like that. You know, like mine today was, if you could eat knowledge, what would it be? So yours could be like, I don't know, like what is spirituality or what, who is God or what, think of something like that. And what I would do is people who go to the Hiltva, I would pull them aside and just have like a little corner and say like, hey, I just want you to stand in front of this and say, greetings, my name is blah, blah, blah. And today I want to share with you, like basically you have a script, like, and I want to share with you what spirituality means to me. And then they just share spirituality means to me, blah, 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 blah. And then like have a sign that's like, you're approaching one minute, like wrap up. So that's what I got. And then you could add like a little post roll that's like, you know, basically like, hey, this was from the hutbah, you know, join us or subscribe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, I, I get the concept. So it's sort of like doing video testimonials, but rather than having them say a testimonial per se, you give them a, a prompt. So it's like different every time. And okay. Usually it's it. the same prompt. Ah. It makes it so much easier. So like if your ED, this would be something your ED would want to do with people like when she's out and about, you know, mm-hmm. she's like, greetings, it's da da da's my name, ED of Women's Master of America. I'm here with, and then I'd be like, Tom Earl. She'd be like, we want to share with you if it was my video, but like my gratitude of the day. I'd be like, why don't you start? And then they'd be like, well, today, Tom, I'm really grateful because this is such an awesome hood bond, da 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 be like, that's awesome. I'm grateful for life. Hey, if you want to check out more, subscribe below. Peace. You know, like it'd be that easy. But yeah, yeah. you could also do at the mosque. So it's not just every single video has her in it. You could say to people like, hey, you know, we like to explore. And you might, you might have like a theme each month. Like maybe if you find mm. out the theme of the hutba, or yeah. the theme of the podcast, like have a prompt around that. And I would ask each person that prompt. And then, then I would share it throughout the month, people's answers. You get a ton of content from people doing that. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So it's one prompt per month, uh, but different prompt every month. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you can do that. Got and it. it's all around the theme. So then you could say yeah. at the end of theirs too. Hey, if you want to check out more, check out this month's re- like replay. Hey, if you want to check out more, check out this month. You just add that same B-roll to every single. So you'd have signs, make sure people don't go over 55 seconds. So like, yeah. you're like wrap it up. And so I give them a way to wrap it up. Because most people are like, huh, huh, I don't know what to say. Ah! So they just keep talking. So I like, have to say like, so and that's why I'm grateful to be here. So like I'd give yeah. them that prompt. I'd give them how to start. I'd give them their ending and I'd yeah. give them what the prompt is and it'll make their life so much easier. Smart. And so that should more or less than it's all just about upload it to Rev, R-E-V.com. Rev mm-hmm. will subtitle it. So even if you have one video per day, it's only gets a dollar a minute. You're only doing dollar, um, one minute videos. So the most you're going to spend is $30 in a month. They'll subtitle it. I use a program called Vemly. And if you download that handout from that training, all of that's in there, V-E-M dot, V-E-M-E dot L-Y, and you can just literally upload the SRT file to your Dropbox, take the app, and like it adds the subtitles for you. Mm. So you don't have to do it like in a program. So you can literally don't have to have any video editing skills. You can just do it on your phone. Coolness. That's hey. what I would do with my two hours. So to summarize, newsletter and podcast are the two things I'd focus on the most. That's what, especially for nonprofits, your newsletter is where people are going to donate and it's where they're going to, you have the, I'd rather have a thousand like people on my newsletter than 6,000 people liking my Facebook page. Mm. Sound good? Yes. That was a fun question. Y'all are asking great questions. Okay. Let's go to the legendary, the infamous Remy. Remy, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So why don't you share a little bit about your amazing self and then your question? Yeah, I am a writer, I think foremost, and a musician. 
Um, and it's mostly it. <laughs> a lot of writing. And That's yeah, awesome. Poetry. I like performing. So, yeah. So, uh, what is your question that I can help with? Um, my first question is, uh, what does spirit sound like to you? Or what does it look like to you? Or, mm -hmm. and, or. So by spirit, do you mean like that kid's got spirit, God darn it. Or like spirit as in like the thing that's a part of my body, but isn't my body like that kind of spirit. The latter one. And the la I've been really wondering this. People have been using this phrase a lot this week. The latter means like the most recent one I said, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So the spirit, the, the, like that essence, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that that looks like similar to what I was talking about with, with the answer I gave to Grant. When we are able to get out of the way and channel. So you can see when somebody is forcing creativity or just going through the motions or whatever kind of art or presentation, whatever industry they're in, or you can see those people who have gotten out of the way and are channeling. In any profession, in any place in their life, there's one place I used to love to shop. There was the security guard that was like an angel. The person would walk everybody to their car, help the old ladies put, and the old men put their groceries in their bag. He'd, re he'd remember you and like remember something about your life that happened the last time you were there. Like every single person who interacted with that person left feeling brighter. And so to me, that person was not like, oh, fucking, you know, I hate this job. Like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. This is a, they're like, this, hey, this is where I'm at. I'm just going to get out of the way and channel. And, and you can see in every interaction. And I think you can hear that in a lot of art. You can see it in art. You can, that when people just get out of the way and channel. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got That's you. That's my answer. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> what was your second one? Um, more, uh, along the lines of what we, what we like talked about a couple of times. Um, it's like, uh, would you rather kind of strive for perfection or kind of like just leave room for imperfection mm. after finishing a product? Mm. For music? Uh, anything. Mm. Really, like any product that you're working on or like project. Is I wanna I want you to be to be selfish though. Is there anything specifically that I can bring value to anything you're troubleshooting in terms of that perfection versus quality thing? I mean maybe writing. Writing? Yeah. And towards the goal of like building an audience or towards writing a book or what's what's the mm -hmm. The objective. Uh, yeah, I guess towards the uh, towards writing of like publishing. Okay. And so in your in your mind, what is the objective of publishing? Um to have a product that's like sellable. Okay. So okay, one, to make to make money. I'm all about that life. What mm. else? Oh, and to have something that's tangible. Tangible? But I'd say like there's also like to make an impact, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think a lot of that also comes back to like audience as well. So you got to have the people, you got to have that, that proof of concept as well. My thing is that when we're in this quality versus quantity game, that especially when we're starting out, I think quantity is better than quality. For one, quality is subjective, especially when it's only you. When you're just sitting there over your own writing, which is something that's very vulnerable, and whenever we're doing something vulnerable, our insecurities are going to come up. Voices that someone else put in our head start speaking, we believe them, and they're usually something around, you're not worthy, no one would like this, you're not doing good enough. So then we say to ourselves, but if I do better, then I can outrun this voice in my head, which we project and say it's what other people will say about our art, but it's really things that our society, systemic, you know, 
discrimination, parent, parents, teachers, you know, Brene Brown and her research, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the exact numbers, but they're something along the lines of, you know, she interviewed 12,000 people around shame and vulnerability. And they found from those interviews that around 70 to 80% of people experience some sort of shame in a learning environment that changed the way they viewed themselves and themselves as learners for the rest of their lives. And this is when they were young. Of those 70 to 80%, more than half, like 60% of those people said they experienced it during some sort of creativity they were doing. So what that really says is that almost all of us, the majority of us have at some time when we were young, we were doing something creative and someone did something, whether intentionally or unintentionally in some sort of way, where we experience shame. And so we are carrying years of that and then sitting down to do art and those voices are speaking to us. And so then we think, well, if I'm perfect, like I can outrun, I can mute those voices, but we, we can't ever do that because one, we're already worthy. So there's that, the like mindset, spiritual part. The other part is there is no truth to when you put out a product and thousands and thousands of people experience that product and nobody buys it, there is some truth to something about it didn't work. Now, mm. it doesn't mean that you're not good enough. It doesn't mean that you're not right for this career path. It doesn't mean that you're not a writer. It meant that if this is my audience, I'm not communicating the thing that I know they're going to love. And you can usually only figure out how you can communicate that through quantity through doing it many at bats, one-on-one, one-on-five, one-on-ten, one-on-a-hundred, and you start to subconsciously and consciously see, oh, when I say it this way, oh, I said it this way, but nobody resonated, but I said that same exact sentence, but only moved around four words and took out two, and oh my God, did it explode. Like when you start to do that, you know, we have like, I don't, I'm going to use a buzzword, we have an algorithm in our mind that starts to pick up on, oh, this, oh, that, and it starts to give you your confidence that you see, oh, I put this out there. Nobody liked it. As an experiment, I put it out the same, same exact thing, but I put it out a different day at a different time and people loved it. So, oh my God, it had nothing to do with the thing itself. It just was people weren't awake that at that time I put it out there. Mm -hmm. So I think you also start to get your confidence and you also start to realize that failure and like crickets and nobody saying anything about this thing that you poured your heart and soul into that, it's, it's a part of the growing process rather than what I find happens is the more um, an emotional intensity you put into a project, then when you put it out there, if it's not received with the same emotional intensity that you've been putting into, that it's usually is devastating. Oh. And then usually the recovery from that failure to when you give another shot is usually a long time. Versus if you're like, my goal is to, where you pick a quantity, my goal is to put out 10 pieces of writing a week, whether that's one sentence, 15 million pages, no matter what, I will put out 10 sentences. And you get a little bit into that quantity game that mm -hmm. you start to develop that muscle memory for failure and success, working towards that thing that's going to be the perfection. But the positive of it is that you're building your audience while you're experimenting with this. So when you're ready for that book release, all that stuff you've been writing becomes a part of what you're going to release. And all those fans that you got, all that community that you got while you were vulnerable and showing the process. I don't know why this is the universal sign for that, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that it culminates both of them at the same time versus one. You know, like if you did all of that for a year, 10 things every single week, 10 things every single week, 10 things every single week. And then you put out that big thing, boom, versus nothing for a whole year. Then I put out the big thing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I'm hoping that I put out this one big thing and it goes viral mm. versus I'm going to build the foundation every single day throughout the year for myself and for my community. So when I put this thing out, they all merge together. So I'd say that you should err on the side of the quantity game. Now, that said, what we talked about last weekend once you've done a lot of that, I think for like, while you're still putting out product, you can have projects where you're erring on the side of quality, but you have much more knowledge and much more data and much more emotional juice where mm. you're a little less 
like hearing your insecurities tell you what quality is and you're actually like have actually a reasonable assessment of quality. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. like Beyonce is a great example. She'll wait a decent amount of time between her albums, but it doesn't mean she's not putting out stuff. Doesn't mean she's not performing every day. Doesn't mean she's not communicating with us. You know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This podcast is not successful. We found a Beyonce reference. <laughs> she made it. She made yes. it. Yes. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions that we didn't get a chance to address or that came up along the process? Can I ask a follow-up question to Remy's question? Yes. And that's Sadia um, for all those out there who are maybe listening and haven't put together everybody's voices. Go ahead, Sadia. Yes. Um, oh, it's actually two, but they're kind of just about you. One, are you interested in writing a book? And two, um, are there any types of performing that you find especially intimidating? Intimidating. Huh. That's nice. Remy liked that too. <laughs> yeah, I do see putting out a memoir or autobiography. And I, I like how Janet Mock did, Janet Mock did it. Like, She's already put out two, you know, and like it broke up her different, li- different stages of her life into two. And she's young, you know, that's badass. So I, I do eventually see doing that. I think I've had some unique twists and turns and life lessons that I think people would resonate. And it's probably going to be cathartic as well. Um, I don't as much feel inspired to put out like a knowledge-based book, although I'm sure I eventually will. But I, I don't feel that calling. Are there any types of performance that I find intimidating? I, I mean, I am a singer. That's what I, I've been in bands singing my whole entire life. And so there was a point where I went from being in bands to being solo. And as part of my solo career, I, for a while, was making my full living as a musician And what that looks like is if you're not a pop culture artist, if you're making your full living as a musician, it means you're playing background music for places. Mm. And so maybe five, six, seven nights a week, usually not seven, I kind of up that number rather quickly, like three, four, (laughs) five nights a week, I would play somewhere and, you know, play my guitar, I had a loop pedal and I'd sing. But what it means is a completely noisy room. You're sitting there singing, nobody's listening to you. And without realizing it after a year of doing that, it's just like really kicked my self-esteem in the butt. Mm -hmm. So I then started to like feel nervous about singing. And so then I started doing spoken word and spoken word went awesome. I got lots of affirmation for spoken word and I got rusty on my singing. So then for a while, singing was something that like I now had associated with pain rather than I used to associate with pleasure. So those, that shame voice was speaking to me. So I did whatever person out there does you hire a coach <laughs> oh god i wonder how many sales pitches have, including my own have like, like culminated stories have culminated with that exact line um i i hired a coach and i did what i recommend a lot of people do is we swapped so i offered her business development coaching she gave me vocal coaching and uh we we got together every single week and for maybe almost a year And getting together for a year culminated with me singing a song, a surprise song for Adora at my January wedding. And it was lots of fun. And so now I don't feel that tension around uh, singing, but for a while I I did feel that. So, but otherwise dancing, I guess if I had to get on a stage and they're like, dance, that would probably make me nervous. (laughs) Any, any other questions team? You don't, you don't have to force the question. So I'll just, I'm just putting it out there if, if you have one. Dude, where's the Tom Roll music at? Sorry, I started to jump in there. I've always, I know this is like part of your, like your backdrop or whatever, but like, I'm so curious to hear like uh, a Tom Roll original or whatever. I, I know. And, and Sadia's heard a couple of them too. So she's asking as well. So in terms of the grant, back to your question, um, I was made a strategic decision that, like, I, you know, I performed all the time. And what I used to do, it was, I remember the exact day. So I, I woke up, it was uh, January 1, 2015. And I was going to bed at like 6 a.m. And I was like, I'm going to write a song every single day 
for the next three months. So I did that for the next three months. I wrote a song every single day. No matter, I was like, no matter what happens, I will write a song. And so I did, I wrote, so I ended up with 90 songs, right? And so I really developed that skill to write songs. I had all these songs and I was performing constantly. So I'm like, and I have the performance down. What I don't have is the distribution. So Mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to invest my time since I have the skill that's already cultivated. I'm going to invest my time in learning social media and how to communicate online. And so that's what I've really been finding. And then the last stage of that is how do I do it from the the agency side? So this last iteration of finding my agency is still in the back of my mind. Like, Oh, I'm going to trick everybody. They think now I'm just about the, the agency and business development. Nope. I'm still, my goal of being a musician is still number one at the forefront, but I had to lay all this infrastructure so that once it's in place, I can put myself through the system that I've developed, you know, and there it is. Everybody hears the music that I've written. So that's my, and then I have to have the time because like I was saying to Remy, it's going to be putting out a song, you know, a song a week. It's going to be doing this. Like it's going to take that consistent time. So it cumulatively builds and I don't have that time yet. So I want to wait till I have the time and the infrastructure and the team to boom, go for it. So Word. that's where it is. And I'm building the mystique. <laughs> if y'all can't hear in the podcast, I did my thing in a very <laughs> mystique way. <laughs> Sami, you s- seemed like you were about to ask a question. Well, uh, yeah, I had a couple of things on my mind. Um, I guess if, if it's okay for us to get heavy again for a little bit, um, I've been actually feeling a little conflicted from an ethical perspective about using social media, uh, uh, you know, and benefiting off social media in terms of making money and stuff. Because like, for example, I've been hearing so much about like how Facebook and YouTube and Google and all these like big tech um, companies that we have become so dependent on they're doing a lot of things that are creating real harm like for example with all the news stories about facebook and not only how facebook's been getting misused by people with bad faith but how they're actually issues with their core business model you know like um uh, you know the the fact that you they they want you to become addicted uh, uh, to their platform, and I mean they're not the only ones. Same with YouTube, and so they put in all these like um, algorithms and create all this kind of an environment, so you 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 become addicted to it, and then you know you are in this environment where you're getting channeled to. Um, more and more extreme versions of the view you initially express interest in. And, you know, so then that, that kind of thing strategy uh, is creating all kinds of problems, but from like mental health issues to, you know, promoting extremism and all this kind of stuff. And it seems like if these are these challenges are arising in part from the very business model that they're following then is it ethically morally you know like acceptable for me to basically be like oh i don't care i don't care about the all this bad effect that it's having i'm just going to use it to create profit for myself mm thoughts on that (laughs) (laughs) does anyone else does anyone want to share anything on that i think sadia we had kind of talked a little bit about this i feel like earlier this week anyone want to jump in remy i saw you on mute were you about to jump in oh yeah it's a little bit go for it oh i don't yeah i mean i don't know i feel like it's hard to move (laughs) like involve like one, it's hard to not be involved in capitalism, and then it's kind of like difficult to delineate where like something's more ethical within capitalism, um, because like we still have to make our money, and I think 
but people like I, I don't know I, I feel like when there is that thought we're not the people who are gonna be like extra exploitative but there's like I don't there's like not really a way of getting around that un, like unethical concerns when you have to use capitalism like you have to Thank you for that, Remy. I, I do resonate with that. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. I want to also say I am ignorant to not knowing all the exact specifics you're talking about where you're saying like at their core. So like, you know, like with like Uber where it came out, the CEO was like, you know, sexist and all these kind of things. And they had all these. So I'm, I'm going to say, I don't know those kind of details about Facebook. So like, are maybe they're as crazy as Amazon where like their employees have to pee in a water bottle because they don't get any breaks or so, you know, I, I don't know those kind of things. So, but let me say like Cambridge analytics where, you know, uh, Russia used Facebook to all those kind of things. I don't think that was Facebook. I think that that was us. So I don't think we can blame hacking and all those kind of things on. And I told the Sadio that I, I can't talk about politics, but I, I can talk about this one that, that was people effectively using a platform to magnify what was already there. And so that's what I think for a lot of social media, that social media in itself isn't inherently evil. It's a magnifier. So if you're a white hmm. supremacist, social media is going to magnify your white supremacy. If you are someone who likes to speak good, social media is going to magnify what speaks good. That said, I have seen people who were monitoring their kids, specifically young white kids, young white men kids. And YouTube kept suggesting to them like uh, influencers who were white supremacist leaning. So I do think that there is an algorithm. There is things like that that can culminate to where we can say this looks sinister. Or you do see like I was just reading uh, TikTok is trying to is in a lot of ways suppressing lgbtq influencers on tiktok because ultimately it's a, a chinese company and there's a lot of suppression of lgbtq people there so all of that does exist that said for me what i find is in the personal decisions when i'm in a position of power to put into place the values that i've been preaching on but now i actually have power to decide which way am i going to go so when i'm hiring somebody and my value, you know, like I'm good at persuasion, I'm good at sales, and not everybody has had the practice and has the privilege to be able to be like, no, fuck you. I want $30 an hour more than what you're giving me. So, you know, when they're like, I want, and this, I'm, I'm making this up, but let's say it's like, I want 100 an hour. And I'm like, how about 15? And they're like, oh, um, um, wow, that, that was way lower than what I said. And rather than countering, how about 95? They're like, okay. Yeah, I'll do 15, you know, then in that moment, I'm like, wow, I got you to go so low that you feel beat up, but I was willing to pay you 95, but now I'm paying you 15 and I have this $80 an hour profit I'm going to make because I was able to do that. Then I'm in the place of a decision of, do I take that? And that $80 I can rationalize is going to help me make a bigger impact. Or do I say like, Hey, like one of the things once you're hired, we're going to work on is your persuasion skills because like you should have been like, no, if you say 15, I say 200, you know, like I think it's in those moments or one moment that I had was I was recording a Facebook ad and I wore a Black Lives Matter shirt. And so I was really like, am I exploiting the Black Lives Matter movement? Because if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and you see a white guy with a Black Lives Matter shirt on, you will pause. And I know that. So yes, I am wearing it because it's something I care about and I want to communicate that throughout all the things I do. But I really had to be like, but is the greater part of me doing it because I know it'll get people to stop in their Facebook feed. And my audience is an audience that likes Black Lives Matter and it instantly communicates to them, this is someone I can trust. Like, am I using this more as a marketing tool than as like promoting something mm -hmm. that I believe in? That was a moment where I had to really be like, Hmm. So I asked a bunch of people. So in those moments, I asked people who, you know, would mirror what they thought. And in the end, Facebook wouldn't let me run the ad anyways until I verified who I was because Black Lives Matter is categorized as like mm. a 
a social cause or a national importance. And what's crazy is just the algorithm. Of, I didn't say Black Lives Matter. wasn't Black Lives Matter in my copywriting. They just were able to scan my shirt out of the millions of Facebook ads and see it was Black Lives Matter. And they said I couldn't run it anyways. But I think like in those moments where I have personal decision, that's where I think about it. But the thing we want to keep in mind is the phrase marketers ruin everything, right? Because it's true. Like I want my stuff to be addictive. I want people to listen to my podcast. Like all of us feel that way about any product or thing. You, Remy wants their music to be addictive. You know what I mean? But it's, I guess and it's like, how far will you go? Do you put subconscious things that it's a frequency that when teens hear, make them go. That's where I think the, you got to decide your own personal line. And it's a line that you really don't know until you actually are in that position. And your job, your family, your social mobility all depend upon you saying no. That's really, I don't think you know until you're in that position. And I think because it's like the, the frog example, which we've all heard, I don't know if it's really true. You, know, you, you boil a, a pot of water, you throw the frog in, the frog will jump out. But if you put the frog in and then you boil it while it's in there, Usually by the time you get to a place where you have to decide one of those big things that to us remove, we're like, I would never. Usually you made a bunch of micro um, compromises that when you got to that one, you were like ready to make it. So I think that's where I try to find where my personal is because while I may hate this company's values, I know that like from a business model, I'm still going to use Facebook. So that's my, my, my answer. So team, I want to be mindful of all of your times. And so I want to think as very conscious of the fact that one person would ask me questions and then y'all on your Friday night literally sat there and listened to me speak. And throughout what I was sharing, I was trying to focus, but I kept feeling this immense sense of humbleness and gratitude for your friendship and for our relationships that you were willing to support me in, and to do that. And so especially I like to be someone who listens, that you all are all here. What I really want to do is just get you all to talk, but I do know that there's, there's value in me getting to share some of the connections I've made from the many podcasts and episodes I've had where I'm listening. So I really want to thank you all so much for, for doing that for me. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting us. Of course. Thanks for having us, Tom. Of course. So y'all aren't off the hook yet. So here's how we're going to conclude. If you're regular listeners, you know that the way we conclude is by sharing an invitation to those who are listening. So I do want to encourage everybody to follow the amazing people that are on here. They're all posting and sharing wonderful content that's uplifting and super awesome. So please follow all them. Show notes are down below. Show notes are tomroll.com slash friends. Show notes for today are tomroll.com slash friends. So all the links are there. You can check that out. So the way we are going to end is once again, if you could all share an invitation. So it's an invitation for that you want people to consider, to be, to think about, to do, to evolve into what is your invitation. So, Sadia, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, the, so, the, what comes to mind is something that you said earlier that really stuck with me. You said a few things that stuck with me, and I appreciate that. But you were talking about making goals and making goals so that you might feel worthy, but actually we're already worthy. Um, so I'm taking that with me, and I would like to invite people to um, – remember that they are already worthy. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you. Grant, whenever you're ready. Sure. So thank you again, Tom. And uh, thank you, Sadia. That was, that was really beautiful. Uh, I'm going to invite you all to consider reading the book, The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. It was a really cool novel about um, Jeju Island off of Korea and just totally exposed me to a, a piece of history I had never considered or really like, you know, delved into. And it was just a really great story, uh, period. So The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. Highly recommended. Wonderful. Thank you, Grant. Mm -hmm. All right. I would like to invite you 
to make a commitment to engage in more acts of kindness in your everyday life. Mm. Um, you know, I, I love to be happy myself and I love to help other people be more happy and engaging in more acts of kindness is one of the best ways we can create even more happiness for all of us. And so make it a goal to like maybe do at least Let's keep it really simple because if you're just starting out, like one extra act of kindness every day. It could be as simple as, you know, you give a smile to somebody that you don't know, but you want to, you know, hold that intention of just giving them a cheerful smile to cheer them up. Wonderful. Thank you, Samia. I would uh, like to invite you, invite you to Islam. <laughs> JK. Um, Give your shahada right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when, uh, Tom mentioned this earlier. I just want to invite everyone to make like an hour, just an hour in the week, like cut out one hour of like, you're not going to do anything, you know, like no phone, no work, just like. It doesn't have to be meditation, but just like letting your mind rest for a bit. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you, Remy. And I love the shout out to my previous social media posts. I'll Venmo you after the, the call. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. I appreciate each and every one of you. Here's how we like to end. Put your arms out in front of you like this. And then cross them, cross them, ah. cross them. Give yourself a hug because you matter. You're important. I appreciate you. So I appreciate y'all so very much. And to all of those listening, as always, we're wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>